So who's the smartest person in the world? Any ideas? You might suggest maybe uh, Ken Jennings. You know, he's the guy who won 74 straight matches on uh, um, Jeopardy and took home a cool two and a half million dollars. Some might say, well, what about uh, Sheldon Cooper, the uh, renowned theoretical physicist of the Big Bang Theory? But of course, he's a fictional character. Some people bring up uh, Gary Kasparov. You know who he was. He was the, Chinese, the Russian uh, chess player who at the age of 22 became the undisputed world champion of chess. Well, if you find it hard to come up with a candidate for the world's smartest person, Dr. Jason Betts can help you out. He's developed the World Genius Directory, the definitive rank ranking of the world's biggest minds. And according to the World Genius Directory, the smartest person in the world is one Dr. Evangelos Katsioulis, a 36-year-old Greek psychologist. This guy's IQ is 198. To put that in perspective, that's 30 points above the genius level. It's almost twice the IQ of the average human being. It is 23 points higher than Ken Jennings' paltry 173. Take that, Jeopardy boy. <laughs> the bottom line is that no matter how you rank them or whether you can name them or not, there are a bunch of smart people in the world. Always has been. Imagine how helpful it would be to have a, a chorus of crazy smart people to help you out, like when you're trying to uh, come up with a church budget or uh, plan the logistics of a multi-site campus or uh, develop an easily navigable website. Or for me, when I do research for a sermon, man, that would cut down on a lot of time. Access to world-class nerds would have its perks. Today in the gospel lesson, Jesus is in a recruitment mode. He's actively drafting members for his team, a team that will eventually be given the task of starting a church, igniting a spiritual movement that will take the gospel to the ends of the world, a gospel that will last till the end of time. If you were Jesus, who would you pick for your elite team? Seriously, if you were Jesus, who would you choose to be on your team? I mean, as any good executive knows, you want to gather around people, gather people around you who are smarter than you are. Oh, sure, it might do your ego some good if you were the top dog and everyone else was inferior. But surrounding yourself with inferior people just drags down the whole, the whole organization. So wouldn't you want to hit up the directory of world geniuses and find the best of the best, the smartest of the smart? You know, find the biggest brain in Palestine to handle your logistics and maybe round out the team with the funniest guy to kind of lighten the mood when ministry gets hard or get the strongest dude when ministry gets dangerous. I mean, that's how we would build our elite team. Oh, but not Jesus. Who does Jesus choose? He chooses the unqualified. Now, it might seem harsh to call James and John, Simon and Andrew unqualified, but it's not. The details given to us by St. Mark make the point clear. These are young men. In a world where life expectancy is short, James and John were old enough to be in the family business and yet young enough to have their father Zebedee in the boat with them. 
In first century Palestine, the ideal career was not to follow in the family business. The brightest boys, those who shined in the yeshiva, would, after completion, attach themselves to a, a rabbi. And if they made the cut, they would follow that rabbi for the next five years, enabling them to become teachers, rabbis, scribes at that. So to be a young man already embedded in the family trade, well, that meant that in all likelihood, you were not the cream of the crop. You didn't have what it takes to run with the rabbis. You were a leftover. The kid who didn't get picked for Red Rover or chosen for playground softball. But why? Why would Jesus choose these people? Notice Jesus didn't cherry-pick his disciples from other rabbis around them. He didn't even get his disciples the usual way, them choosing him first and he picking out the ones that he wanted. Instead, Jesus went on a mission looking for the leftovers, seeking out the also-rans. And after he drafted them, and then drafted them, which, again, according to worldly standards, wouldn't be the smartest things to do. So why? Why did Jesus forsake the genius list and deliberately pursue those who didn't make the cut? This is the answer. Jesus chooses, chose simple and unaccomplished disciples so that the love and power of God would be undeniably evident to an unbelieving world. In other words, those simple and unschooled tradesmen would become living, breathing object lessons on the depth of the riches of God's grace and the scope of God's power. No one would be able to claim that they were privileged to walk with Jesus because of their resume. No one would be able to claim that the kingdom of God grew because of their IQ. It was all God. Take, for example, the post-resurrection narrative of Acts chapter 4. We find the same disciples, give or take a few. And after Jesus gives them the key to the mission, go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, we find them passionately championing the expansion of God's kingdom. Brought before the council in Jerusalem, they were passionately and effectively proclaiming the gospel. And the council of Jerusalem, they were blown away, not only by the message that they gave, but by the people, the messengers themselves. St. Luke writes, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. You see, the earth-shaking news of the gospel being delivered in such unexpected vessels elicited an even greater awe of God and a clearer evidence of the power of God of Jesus. So let's bring it to today. Let's bring it to you. Why do you think God chose you? Yes, it's ultimately because God loves you and he wants to have an eternal relationship with you. But was there something in you or about you that made God love you? Maybe it's your IQ. Your mom always said you were smart. Maybe it's your style. You know, God knew that you could make his kingdom look better. 
Or maybe it's your type A, go-getter, high-functioning, action-oriented personality. Did God choose you or call you through his word and choose you in holy baptism, placing every promise of the cross upon your life because God saw something awesome in you? No. He chose you the same reason he chose the 12 disciples. Because you make an excellent object lesson for the depth of the riches of God's grace and the scope of God's power. You, with your rebellious heart. You, with your secret struggles. You, with your lack of faith and list of faults. You, who are not even worthy to untie God's shoe or much less be called a child of God. God chose you so that the world might look at you and see how incredibly merciful God is and how indescribably powerful God is. Ever thought of yourself that way? You are an object lesson of God's mercy and God's power. That said, the question you might be asking yourself at this point is, so what? You can proclaim the truth that God has chosen us completely out of mercy all day long. And we should. I mean, there's no better news than that, that God has saved us by his grace. But how does that translate into our everyday life? What are we called to do in response to this gracious, undeserved gift? The answer is found in the action of the disciples. What do we see them do when Jesus came and tapped them on the shoulders? What do we see them do when the rabbi walks up to them and says, I want you? They drop everything and follow. They drop their nets. They leave their father in the boat. Why? Because when something you don't deserve and yet desperately needs come knocking at the door, you don't say, hey, wait a minute, I'll get around to it. You answer the door as fast as you can. God has called you to be his disciple, chosen you by his Holy Spirit. We've each been given something that we don't deserve but desperately need. Forgiveness, salvation, life in Christ. Our task each day as an object lesson of God is to see life with Jesus as an invitation an undeserved invitation to drop our plans and follow the master. Follow him wherever he may take us, knowing that wherever the master leads, it is better and more beautiful than any of the plans we ever had. So when Jesus calls me tomorrow morning to love my annoying neighbor, It is a gift of grace and a chance for the power of God to shine in my weakness. After all, I'm not the best at loving the unlovable. When God calls me to invite my co-worker to church, it is a gift of grace and a chance for the power of God to shine forth in my weakness because I'm not always so comfortable in talking about my faith. When God calls me to walk with him in illness, to bear a burden, it is a gift of God and a chance for the power of God to shine forth in my weakness. 
it's not so easy to believe in the goodness of God and the victory in Christ when chemo was pumping through your veins. Every day, there is an opportunity as a disciple of Jesus for the world to watch in astonishment as ordinary, unschooled, undeserving people live as examples of God's mercy and the power and, God, and proof of God's power. God didn't have to choose you, but he did. God didn't have to use us, but he does. And the end result is not just a blessing for us. It is a blessing for the world and for the glory of God's name. So who is the smartest person in the world? Sure, the World Genius Directory claims to have the answer for you, but that's only if you define smart as the ability to solve puzzles and the score of your IQ. Maybe what makes one smart is not your ability to have the right answer. Maybe what makes one smart is the ability to recognize a good thing when it comes your way. You know, plenty of smart people have passed on Jesus. But not James and John. Not Simon and Andrew. They were chosen by Christ. And they dropped everything to follow him. Sure, they may have been the leftovers, but the decision to follow Jesus, pure genius. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses our human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.